Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. My name is Dominic, and we're hosting Federico Lopez and Beatrice Posetti to discuss their latest paper, Symmetric Spaces for Graph Embeddings. In this paper, they use notions of uh, hyperbolic manifolds to embed node features in a graph and improve node classification and link prediction. If you want to join the reading group yourself, you can check the link in the description where you will find uh, our Zoom link, our Slack channel, and even our Twitter handles. And you can follow us to keep updated on the latest news in graph neural networks. And uh, we can notice that all these uh, spaces are in fact particular instances of a more general class called symmetric spaces. So what we notice basically is that the unified framework in which to encompass all these various examples is still missing. And that is basically what we came here to propose. We propose a systematic use of symmetric spaces in representation learning. This is a class comprising all the aforementioned spaces. And the main reason why we choose or, or we, we treat symmetric spaces in a bit more systematic way is because we have, uh, they're very well studied in the math literature. So we already have closed form expressions available that we just have to go to a math book and take it and use it. And they are uh, amenable to optimization, given the, the symmetry groups that they have and so on. So the framework that we, we propose is um, basically you choose a symmetric space at the beginning that you want to work with. And then if you follow the framework, we tell you how to plug in or how to integrate formulas to measure the distance and compute the gradient in order to uh, learn graph embeddings. So the output of our framework is a neural model that is able to learn uh, graph embeddings in any chosen space that, that you, you pick. Since studying this implementation, or, or sorry, since studying this framework uh, is a bit complicated in, in an abstract way, we will look at one concrete implementation for Siegel spaces. That is the one that we propose in the paper as well. So um, let's go on Siegel spaces in particular, and we choose uh, this family of symmetric spaces of non-positive curvature, because basically they are a generalization of the hyperbolic plane. So uh, the advantage of Siegel spaces is that they have a very rich geometry that combines Euclidean subspaces, hyperbolic subspaces, and products of Euclidean cross hyperbolic. So the main thing in a way is that in one uh, single space, you can have the best of the two worlds that is combining these two different geometries into one unified way. That's why we consider them an excellent tool for learning embeddings of complex networks because they can automatically adapt to the similar graphs without any a priori knowledge of the, of the internal structure of the graph. So uh, the way we represent the points in the single spaces is not by using vectors, uh, usually for imagine this is a graph and uh, for each node in the graph, instead of having one uh, vector embedding, we will have one matrix. This is gonna be in particular a complex symmetric matrix. This means that it's a matrix that is symmetric and it has real and imaginary components, right? So by the time we, we implemented this work, uh, the PyTorch was not super mature yet with complex operations. So we had to implement many of the operations on our own, which was part of the fun of the project. And then the two models that we will use from the single spaces are the bounded domain model. That is a generalization of the Poincare disk that we saw before and the Siegel upper half space model that is a generalization of the upper half plane model of the hyperbolic space. So if you remember before that in the Poincare, the, sorry, in the hyperbolic space, we had two models, the hyperboloid and the Poincare disk. This is the same idea. These are two different models to represent the same type of information in Siegel spaces. So something that is super important to our framework is how to measure distances. Basically, uh, what we will do is we will measure distances in the graph and we will try to uh, get an embedding space that uh, holds or keeps the same distances in a graph, but in the space, right? So um, in order to, to, to explain this part of measuring distances, I will, uh, let's start by an analogy and imagine that you're in a city and I ask you uh, the distance from one point to, the, uh, to another. So if you tell me the straight line distance, you're basically telling me the Riemannian distance. But if you tell me how many blocks I had to walk in this grid-like city, for example, you are telling me the taxi cab or the Manhattan distance, right? Uh, or the, the one that we call the L1 distance. So these notions can be generalized in single spaces uh, using Finsler distances. So the, we also have the remaining distance in the single space, so we can generalize the notion of the L1 or L infinity metric or many other by employing Finsler distances. And why do we consider Finsler distances or why do we think that they are important? 
uh, and again, let's work with an example. And imagine that you have a graph uh, that, that is like a grid, like a two-dimensional grid here, and you want to embed this graph into uh, the Euclidean plane. So you place A, B, C, and D, the nodes that you have here, you, you learn embeddings in this two-dimensional space, and then you compute distances. And you want the distance in the space to be the same as the distance in the graph, right? So from A to B and A to C, the distance is one, and the same thing happens in the space. But from A to D, the distance is two in the graph, right? You have to take two hops to go from A to D. But in space, the distance is the square root of two. And this is because in this case, you're using the Riemannian distance and uh, the length minimizing path is unique. Now, if instead we endow the, the plane with the L1 metric, uh, we get uh, the same embedding space basically, but when we compute the distances, we see that they are not distorted anymore. Now the distance from A to D is actually two as in the graph. And moreover, the geodesics are not unique, which is also a behavior that happens in graph. To go from A to D, we have different shortest path and they are equally short, right? They are equally valid. So the same thing is happening in the space that by using this Finsler distance, uh, we can represent these two notions of like not distorting the distance on one hand and on the other hand, having more than uh, one geodesic. Uh, that's why we argue that Finsler distances are better suited to represent uh, graphs. And finally, uh, regarding distances, uh, another tool that we introduce uh, is the vector value distance. That is a very important tool to measure distances in symmetric spaces. And again, to, to understand this, let me go with a very simple analogy. Imagine that you want to measure the distance between A and B in this, in this plane. Um, so you can just measure the distance, but just by, for the sake of an analogy and as an example, imagine that another way to measure the distance is you can learn some transformation that moves the point A to the origin of the space. And you can, and you can apply the same transformation to B and move B to a place, to, to a point, that represents the relative difference between A and B, right? So now you have one vector that um, by computing different norms on this vector, you can compute different notions of distances between A and B, right? If you take the L2 norm on this vector, you're getting the distance between A and B. But if you take the L1 norm on this vector, you're getting the L1 distance between A and B, right? So this is just an example of how we can extend this notion into single spaces. And then basically, I mean, don't look at the algorithm now, at least if you wanna go through this, we can look at it later. But the notion or the idea of what we're doing here is exactly the same. We have two points in single space, set one and set two, and we apply a transformation that moves set one to the origin and set two to a point that represents a relative difference, right? And then by taking some operation, we get one vector and we call this vector the vector value distance, right? So from the, by taking different norms on this vector, we can get different notions of the distance in the single space. So this has two advantages. The first one is that by taking only one vector, we can compute different notions of the distance, right? The remaining distance, the F1, the F infinity, and many more. And second advantage is that this vector value distance vector um, contains much more information than only the distance. And this will be exploited later. And uh, I, I will show you later how we can exploit this extra information that we have. And last, uh, the, the thing that we need to, to optimize our weights to learn our embeddings is basically we want to perform uh, stochastic gradient um, uh, optimization. Um, so the, the common way to apply stochastic gradient descent in, a, in, a, in the Euclidean form, we already have the formula, but in this case, we want to apply Riemannian stochastic gradient descent because we're not in a Euclidean setup anymore. So we need to take the Euclidean gradient that we get by um, uh, applying any automatic differentiation tool like Pyte or TensorFlow, or whatever, uh, that would give you the, the Euclidean gradient. But then we need to transform it into the Riemannian gradient, right? To apply Riemannian uh, optimization. But the cool thing is that since you're working with symmetric spaces, as I said at the beginning, all these formulas are available. They are explicit. They have a closed form expression that we just need to go and take from the math book and code it in our framework. So it's very easy in a way to do this conversion and this conversion uh, we have for granted that it exists because symmetric spaces are very well studied. So just to recap what we have seen so far is um, we chose a, a symmetric space, the Siegel space. We'll have a look at two models that is the bounded domain model and the Siegel upper half space model. We know that the points in our space or the embeddings that we're gonna learn are complex symmetric matrices 
We can compute different types of distances between the points in our space. We can compute the Riemannian distance and many other Finsler distances. And we have already explicit formulas to do gradient conversion so we can optimize our weights and we can learn embeddings. So with all this, we can already run experiments. So the initial set of experiments, yeah, you're, are you raising a hand or? Yeah, if you can go back to the previous slide. Yeah, um, here. Yeah. So just to, to be clear here, uh, when you have the points in space represented as complex symmetric matrices, uh, what are exactly these uh, these matrices? What, what do the value represent? How many rows and columns do you have? Uh, I, I will go now into the dimensionality because it's an important thing. Um, but yeah, the matrix are here, here you have the properties that they have to have. Basically, if you're in the bounded domain model, it's a complex symmetric matrix that uh, sticks to this property, basically, that the identity minus the point conjugated times the point has to be positive definite. And if you're in the singular perhaps half space, basically the imaginary part has to be uh, positive definite. Uh, so these are, I mean, this is like pure math in a way, and, and these are like how these single spaces are defined in, in the math literature. So basically in our model, what we, by, by optimizing in the proper way, by applying remaining optimization, we grant that these properties hold all the time for the points for our embeddings. Okay, so the, the embedding, the matrices are learned, right? Yeah, that's exactly, the that's the whole point. We're gonna try to learn okay. these embeddings to represent each node in the graph. Okay, perfect. So the, yeah, here, the first set of experiments that we will run is um, we uh, take the, um, the graph, uh, we try to embed it uh, and learn one, um, one embedding for each node in our graph. And then from the embedding space, we try to reveal the original graph, right? So by comparing the graph that we obtain from the embedding space and to the original graph that we are supposed to get, uh, that's how we will measure the, the quality of our embeddings or how the, the representation capacity at least of our embeddings. So the loss function that we use has been used in previous work and it's just um, that the distance in the space has to be the same as the distance in the graph. And the two metrics that we track, it's a global metric that is distortion and it's basically computing the distance in the space uh, and comparing it to the distance in the graph and between each pair of nodes, right? So this is a global metric because it tracks from each node to any other node, how well we can represent the distances. And then the average precision is basically uh, how good are we at, at rebuilding the one hop neighborhood. So the idea is that the closest uh, nodes in the graph should be the closest points to you in the embedding space, right? So by tracking these two metrics, we get a global and local notion of how well we are rebuilding the graph. And then we compare our approach to Euclidean hyperbolic baselines, Cartesian products, that was the state of the art uh, before and to the SPD manifold that is the symmetric positive definite uh, manifold, matrix manifold. So initially we run experiments with uh, synthetic graphs. So what we have here is uh, we have six, six different types of graphs, a grid, a four dimensional grid that should fit very well in, in a Euclidean space, a tree that as we saw before, it should fit very well in a hyperbolic space, a uh, tree cross grid uh, that is here, the, what we have here, the Cartesian product of a tree and a grid uh, that should fit very well in a Euclidean cross hyperbolic uh, Cartesian product of spaces. Tree cross tree that should fit very well in a hyperbolic cross hyperbolic. And then finally, we have two rooted products that these are a bit more interesting because uh, you have a tree that at each level has a grid. So you have like in a very intertwined way, you have um, tree-like and grid-like behavior or hyperbolic and Euclidean behavior in a way, right? And the last one is the opposite, right? A, a grid that has at each node a tree hanging. So we compare to uh, Euclidean hyperbolic and Cartesian products and SPDs of equal dimensions. So in all these cases, we have 20 dimensions in each space. And we compare to uh, single spaces that have matrices of four times four in this case, uh, to answer the, the previous question. Uh, so having a matrix of four times four uh, that is complex, uh, so that means that has real and imaginary degrees of freedom, but it's symmetric, that gives you 20 degrees of freedom, basically. So you have in each of these, in these spaces of rank four, you have 20, 20 dimensions, and that's why we compare to Euclidean spaces of 20 dimensions. 
Um, and then what we notice here is that we run the experiments with the Siegel model, with the bounded domain model, and with Riemannian Finsler infinity and Finsler one metric. And what we see is that with the Riemannian metric, we can match uh, the best um, geometric space. So basically we, uh, with the Riemannian metric here, we work as well as Euclidean, but here we work as well as hyperbolic, but in this other graph, we work as well as um, uh, hyperbolic cross Euclidean, and the, in this order we work as well as uh, hyperbolic cross hyperbolic and so on. So basically with one single space, we can tie the best performance of many different spaces in their best performing graph. So that is already very good news, right? But once we endow the single space with a Finster metric, that is the one that we argue that should be much better at representing graphs, we can significantly outperform all the baselines in, in pretty much all the graphs. So one thing, something that is pretty cool here is that in the four dimensional grid, having a space of rank four fits perfectly. So with the Finster one metric, we can achieve a perfect distortion. That means that all the distances in the in a four dimensional grid are preserved exactly the same in this uh, space of rank four, right? And then in many other cases, again, we, we don't achieve a perfect distortion, but still we can outperform the baselines by significant differences. And once we look at real world data sets, um, we have here this like same metrics, same baselines, and uh, the graphs are, this is a graph of cities in California. This is a graph of diseases that share some sort of genetical, um, they have some sort of genetical overlap. This is a graph of uh, PhD students and advisors, and another graph of cities in Europe and a graph derived from Facebook from social network that is pretty dense. And again, we have very similar results to the previous case that with the Riemannian metric, we can achieve a very good performance across many different graphs, but with the Finster one metric, we can outperform all the baselines. And this shows the strong reconstruction capabilities of the symmetric spaces also for real world data. So it's not something that works on toy experiments, but it works on, on, on real world data. That's the, the cool thing. And then, uh, of course, we have a reviewer too saying, what about high dimensional spaces? Because we're only using matrices of four times four and we're comparing to 20 dimensional spaces. So maybe that's not large enough. So we run uh, experiments with um, much larger uh, spaces. In this case, we are using matrices of 17 times 17. And this is the equivalent of using a 306 dimensional space. So what we notice here is that, of course, as we increase the dimensionality of our models, our results become better. But the interesting thing is that by using spaces of rank four only, which is the equivalent of 20 dimensions, we can already outperform the baselines with 306 dimensions in many cases. So this uh, again shows the importance of choosing the right geometry instead of just increasing the dimensionality of your model. Um, so th this is also very interesting and a nice result, I think. And yeah, Dominic or... Sorry, I only see Dominic on the screen, so uh, I only see his questions. If anybody else is raising the hand, also stop me. And uh, uh, well, if uh, if someone raises his hand, I think uh, you'll see. But uh, there's no one at the moment. Uh, there's a question in the chat, and I think I will uh, I will say it instead. Um, so first, like uh, the results are are very awesome. Uh, one of the questions is in the chat about the previous slide um, when you have the real world experiment. Um, they're asking if it's node classification or what kind of uh, like uh, they're asking exactly like uh, what what kind of uh, problem are you solving here? Uh, graphic it? graphic construction is what we're doing. Basically, we graphic construction take the whole graph, embed it in the space, and then by only looking at the space, we try to rebuild the original graph. So yeah. basically, what we are tracking is how well we can represent the distances in the graph, and and how well we can rebuild the local neighborhoods. And then uh, these four cases are unweighted graphs, and this uh, is weighted. So in this case, uh, you have the distances, normally it helps. Mm -hmm. I think and, this one, well, sorry, yeah. And right now you don't use any kind of edge or node features, right? You're only working on the space of graph. Excellent, yeah. Okay, and if you go also to the previous slide, um, one of the questions uh, I have, like not a question, but, I think these results are very good. And one thing that would be interesting to see, like right now you have perfect spaces and you're comparing to some, um, uh, you, you're comparing to some method of like embedding the distances that are made specifically for these spaces. And one thing that would be interesting is to look at, well, you take this space and now you add randomness to them. So you still have the 4D grid, the three, the three grid, the three, uh, the three times three and, 
you kind of look at, okay, now we add a 10% randomness on the connections there. So it still has this general architecture and see like, well, how much the traditional metrics uh, start failing versus how much your metric starts uh, failing. Um, and I think that would be also a great experiment, but you already have lots of experiments that show uh, the superiority, uh, I think, of your model as well. Yeah, basically we we experiment with these like perfect graphs just to understand more or less how the model works and how it compares to also the, the embedding that the, the embedding space that matches exactly the geometry of the graph. Uh, that's why like these uh, these are like on, on very perfect data, let's say. And that's why also we run real world uh, or experiments or, or uh, with data from real world. So it's like, okay, maybe you're doing like, you know, this sort of like perfect experiments and only it works there, but not on real world data. But then on real world data also, we get very good results. Uh, so this, again, these are not randoms, they, uh, but at mm -hmm. least they, they are real world. So it's like, okay. Uh, okay. And but uh, yeah, yeah, we, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a good. Yeah, perfect. No, and uh, right now you're, you're working on um, reconstructing the, the graph, meaning that like you get back exactly the distances, the original distances of the graph with your four by four matrix. So this four by four matrix, uh, how do you get a distance from that uh, matrix? I think you probably explained it earlier, but just as a reminder. Yeah, uh, this is the, like in the, in the paper, they are like uh, much better described in a way, but we have these boxes of how to compute the distance in the in the space. Uh, so it's a bit of a complicated algorithm, but the idea is what I described before that is like, basically you move one embedding, these are set one and set two are two complex symmetric matrices uh, that are two embeddings in the space, two points of whatever, right? In, in your mm -hmm. single space. So what you do is like you try to move, you try now, you move one to the origin of the space and you move the other to somewhere that represents the relative difference. Then uh, once you have only basically one matrix uh, because one is the origin, so you only care about W now and then you factorize W um, and then um, by, by applying some operation on W that is like taking the logarithm of the eigenvalues and so on, uh, basically you get one vector. And then from this vector, like the details are written here. I don't know if that's important at this moment, but the idea is that from this W, by playing with the eigenvalues, you get one vector. And this vector um, is the vector value distance. So by taking the different norms on this vector, you get different distances. So uh, basically I have this vector of N values. In, if, the, if the rank of the space is four, then this vector will have four entries. And then if you take the, you know, the Euclidean norm, basically from this vector, you get the Riemannian distance. If you take the L1 norm on this vector, you get the Finsler one distance. And if you take the L infinity norm on this vector, you get the F in Finsler infinity distance. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting that you can kind of compress, you take a, a very large graph and you can compress uh, all distances into like this small matrix. Um, so yeah, the, yeah. It, it's like for each node in the graph, you have one matrix, right? It's like any yeah. embedding algorithm that for, N nodes, you have N embeddings in space. Yeah, so that's that's kind of nice. Um, like, uh, so for each node, you only have this four by four matrix. Uh, and I know yep. there's a lot of work right now regarding like uh, developing positional encodings in graphs. Um, and uh, like, for example, using them for fully connected transformers. Um, yeah. Many of the, the methods either use like um, shortest path distances or uh, diffusion distances or directly use the the, uh, the eigenvectors. But here you have something I think that um, really compresses all the notion of distances into a very small matrix. And do you think it could be used as a positional encoding to, head, to help uh, graph neural networks and uh, graph transformers understand the distance between each pair of nodes? Um, yeah, yeah. The only thing that I wonder in, in that case is that uh, like, I mean, this conveys the distance in a very nice way and, and a very compact representation. Uh, but at the same time, the geometry that you're working here is uh, this non-Euclidean geometry. So if you want to use this into an Euclidean setup, then you have to do some trick in between to like convey the same information, you know, like to translate, let's say from this non-Euclidean setup to a Euclidean setup in case that you're using just a, like a transformer based on Euclidean operations. But yeah, we'll see now later uh, some 
like downstream task where we can try, we try to extract a bit more like Euclidean like information from here. Um, so I continue or? Yeah, you can go on. Yeah, thanks. And, and then again, uh, if I don't see the question, just open the, mi the microphone and, and interrupt and it's another problem. Um, so, okay, we close this that yeah, we have like this, uh, nice results even compared to high-dimensional uh, spaces. And then we uh, can try to analyze the embedding space because we get this embedding space again um, with uh, with this richer structure given the symmetric space. So the, the, we propose one rather simple tool. Uh, the idea of this tool is just to showcase uh, how this can be used. And, and then there are even more interesting properties in a way to extract from here. But again, as we were saying before, um, every time that I compute the distance between any two points, I get one vector. And then from this vector, I compute the distance, right? But this vector, uh, what I said before is that it contains um, much more information than just the distance. So by uh, analyzing this vector in itself, uh, every time you take any distance between uh, pair of points, um, you can get extra information for free, basically. So what we do is uh, we take a two dimensional case, like a matrix of two times two, uh, we embed the graph there, we compute the distances, we compute all pairs of distances in the embedding space. And then by, sorry, not all pairs, but uh, we can be the distance from each node to their neighbor. So we can um, get a vector for each edge and, and then we just look at the angle of the vector. So this vector is gonna be between zero and uh, 45 degrees or P over four, right? So by getting this vector, we can color we, we get a color assignment based on this vector. So like what I'm saying here is like, I take the distance between these two um, nodes in the space, right? This gives me a vector. I look at the angle of this vector that is only always going to be between zero and P over four. And given this color scale, basically I put, if it's zero, I put yellow color. If I put, if not, I put blue color, right? So by analyzing this over different types of data, what we get to notice is that um, if you look at this graph, for example, you have a tree where uh, grids are hanging from every node. So we get that, we, we can see that the grid edges, the, the edges from the grid, they get one color assignment while the edges that belong to the tree, they get a different color assignment. So that means that the angles of the vector value distance are completely different. Again, if you look at this example, we have a grid where trees are hanging and the same thing happens. The edges that belong to the grid, they get one color assignment while the edges that belong to the tree, they get a completely different color assignment. That means that the angles of the vectors are very different. So what this is basically telling us is that the edges or the points that belong to the tree are falling into the hyperbolic subspaces of the single space, while the edges that belong to the grid are falling close to the Euclidean subspaces of the single space. And we can use this idea to um, analyze real world data. So I, I go, Dominic. Um, so the idea here is that we can look at the, um, at the plots of the, the real world data and we can look at the edges and we see that some edges get more like yellowish color that they are falling close to the hyperbolic subspaces while other parts of the edges or parts of the graph, um, they, they fall into the Euclidean subspaces. Yes, Dominic. Yeah, so uh, here you, you don't choose any node or edge feature. So basically it's only regarding the, the graph structure. And one thing, like if we look at the, the first graph, like uh, this one here, um, yeah. well, what we can see is that it's uh, perfectly symmetric. Uh, this branch is exactly the same as yeah. this other branch. Uh, but then if we look at the node, uh, the edge coloring, well, this, edge color is different than uh, this other one and this yeah, yeah. other one and this other one, despite them being uh, perfectly symmetric. So, so what, it, what does it mean really to have this angle and why uh, are other parts of the graph that are perfectly symmetric to that edge, well, do not get the same color? Also yeah, basically, this yeah. In, in this case, uh, what we are doing again um, is we are embedding the graph uh, without telling anything to the network, without saying like, this is a grid, this is a tree, like we just embed the graph. And by uh, optimizing the loss function that we saw before, the model automatically learns to place. 
some parts of the graph close to the hyperbolic subspaces and other parts close to the Euclidean subspaces. And by using this coloring tool in a way, or this coloring idea, uh, what we get to see is basically that difference. So uh, yeah, what you're saying is correct. And then in this case, I don't know, like basically the network is assigning here, um, like it's placing this close to the Euclidean subspace and because the network chooses to do so. And and yeah, that's what the coloring is showing. And yeah, it only does it for this edge and not so much for the others. So yeah, uh, it's, I cannot tell you why. Like, I mean, this is like a very simple embedding and I don't know why uh, in this case, this falls into the Euclidean subspace. Uh, but in, for example, in the other cases, uh, we can very easily see that the, um, the difference is very, uh, you can distinguish very well the difference between the, the tree-like parts of the graph and the grid-like parts of the graph. In this case, this is just a tree, so it, everything should fall into the, the hyperbolic subspace, and for some reason this doesn't. But yeah, I, I couldn't explain why, like this is just like a, a decision of the embedding. Uh, maybe it wasn't necessary and it's still like by placing this into the Euclidean subspace, uh, it could preserve the distance anyway, so it wasn't necessary. I, but that's my hypothesis, like honestly, I don't, I don't know. Uh, the, the cool thing in a way is that by embedding larger graphs, uh, we can also discover like, for example, um, communities in a way, or like parts of the graph that behave a bit more like uh, grids or that are very well connected. Whereas the parts that are not so well connected and they behave a bit more like a tree, they fall closer to the hyperbolic spaces. Um, but yeah, this is like the idea of this uh, analysis is just to uh, show showcase how from the vector value distance, you can get much more information that can be exploited for different tasks or for different analysis tools. Um, but what we are doing in this case is pretty simple in a way. And again, you can see how the parts are very well connected. They get some coloring while parts are more disconnected. They get a different coloring. And this is just how the network is choosing to place the embeddings in space. So since it's so hard to visualize uh, like a complex symmetric matrix uh, of four times four, basically we try to, to shed a bit of light on what the network is learning by analyzing this. And again, this is just one example of many different things that can be done. Uh, okay, thanks uh, for the answer. Uh, just like a hypothesis, maybe it has to do also with the uh, coloring that you use, maybe instead of uh, from zero to pi divided by four, the coloring is from zero to max. Uh, yeah, yeah. It seems that, in in this yeah. in these examples, it could be because these are more like toy examples that we did at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it could also be that. And there's uh, one question on the chat asking like, uh, what does the measure of the angle mean? Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, you're it's kind of a projection on the hyperbolic space, and the angle is like how badly it fits on that space, right? Yeah, uh, for that. Uh... I don't know if Bea is here. Yeah, so not quite. Uh, so it's like the point that this vector that Federico was presenting before was really a, as a, at a well-defined angle. Like, so for example, when you compute the L1 metric, you need to know what is the horizontal and the vertical. So if you rotate the plane, you change the L1 metric a lot. So the horizontal is well-defined for this vector. And this angle is really the angle with respect to the horizontal direction. And these are the geometric meaning in the geometry of symmetric spaces, but uh, that goes a bit in direction of finding the hyperbolic planes and the flat subspaces. But uh, so this angle is really like, this is a vector in the plane that has an angle with the real line. And that's, uh, that's what that angle map, map measures. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. So, like, okay, so if you're in a multi dimensional space, like, do you just basically fix one of the axes, and that's kind of the axis you kind of com uh, compute the angle with respect to, or like, you know, how because you could pick, like, here you could pick the y axis, for instance, and you get another angle. So, so that's what I'm confused about. Yeah, that is right. So, like, in the like, in R2, it's basically there is a easy function between the angle with the vertical and the angle with the horizontal. So it's basically the same information, but it's true we also have experiments in much higher rank where the vector is a vector in R and for example, the experiments that Federico was presenting before was for four by four matrices and then would have a vector with four entries. And in that case, we're also analyzing various projections on various axes and measuring various angles and see what this 
uh, I mean, which kind of information that recovers from us for us or for the graph. For the graph. Well, thank you. Yeah, Bea is a co-author of this paper and the mathematical mastermind behind this. So the math questions are usually for her. Um, so uh, now we will have a look at two two applications that we do um, for um, like basically we we embed this graph and again the task that we we're performing at the beginning was graph reconstruction that is just uh, a, a task that we do to understand uh, the representation capacities of our of our framework of of our embeddings. But um, the idea is not to embed the graphs for the sake of embedding them, but to do something with them. Uh, so in this case, we present you downstream tasks that can be profit from uh, a much better representation capacity. So the first one is the recommender systems. And again, the idea in recommender systems uh, is to usually you have a set of users and a set of items, and you try to mine this um, matrix of users and items. But we can also look at this matrix as a bipartite graph. So you can have a bipartite graph of users on one hand and items on the other. And what you try to do is edge prediction, basically, um, and try to predict uh, the new edge or basically which uh, item will like the user. So for that, we uh, optimize this um, distance-based loss function in which we try to place uh, items close to users that we know that they have liked in the past and uh, items that they did not like far away from them, right? And again, we compared to the same baselines than before in, again, 20 dimensional case. And we analyzed four different um, recommender systems uh, data sets. And uh, again, we, we have very similar results to before. Uh, we see that the system learns to model the user's preferences by embedding them in space. And then in two data sets, the remaining metric works very well. And the other two metrics, in the other two data sets, sorry, uh, the F1 metric uh, works pretty well. So the, the idea of this simple task in a way, like I know that for recommender systems, there are much more advanced tools, but the idea is to showcase again, how a downstream task can profit from the enhanced representation capacity of, of the method and how flexible it is also that by just optimizing any um, distance-based function in a way, you can get already a very good representation of the graph and downstream tasks can profit from it. And another task that we do is node classification. And again, this idea is to, um, this is not the, the graph neural network type of graph classification that is based on features. But in this case, we try to classify only based on the graph structure. So basically we take a graph uh, where we know that some um, points belong to different classes and we uh, embed this graph as it is in the building space. And then uh, again, what I was talking before with Dominic uh, on how to extract some sort of Euclidean information from here. And each embedding in this at this point is a complex symmetric matrix. So what we do is we map this complex symmetric matrix into a flat vector representation. And then once we have this flat vector representation, we can feed a, a regular classifier and try to classify. And again, we have very good results with um, the Siegel upper half space model with the Finsler one metric across three different data sets. And uh, the idea is to show how the embeddings capture the structural properties of the data set and how this information, again, can be exploited into downstream tasks. And most importantly, how we can uh, integrate uh, these remaining symmetric spaces tools or embeddings with classical Euclidean layers. Uh, again, this operation is not that trivial, and then we can go through it with a bit more of detail, um, because this is not just taking entries of the matrix, but it, it's imagine uh, it's similar to applying the um, uh, like a logarithmic map and trying to map, in a way, the points to a flat representation and then from there, try to extract the vector. So um, going back to the general framework that I was talking at the beginning, everything we have seen so far is one concrete particular implementation on single spaces. But what we propose in the paper is not only that concrete implementation, but a more general framework. So the framework goes uh, in the following three steps, basically. The first one is choosing one Riemannian symmetric space uh, and a model of it. And for our implementation, again, we chose the single space but there are 11 infinite families of symmetric spaces. So you can choose any uh, that you like. And then by following the, the framework, uh, we know that all the tools are already available. We know that all the formulas are already out there. So we just tell you how to take the formula and plug it in to, in order to achieve a differentiable distance function that is gonna be based on the vector value distance that we just saw before. 
And uh, we also tell you how to perform Riemannian uh, gradient-based optimization by just transforming the Euclidean gradient into the, the Riemannian gradient. And the output of this framework, again, is a neural model that can learn graph embeddings in the chosen space. So the framework in the paper looks a bit more like this, um, where these are like basically toolkits that tell you uh, which tools you need to get once you choose your symmetric space and where to plug them in in order to get the, the differential distance function and uh, to be able to perform gradient-based optimization. And as a summary of what we saw today or a summary of the paper in a way, uh, again, we present a general framework for embeddings in symmetric spaces. And along with this framework, we present two tools. Um, one is the FinSAR metrics that we argue that they have better representation capacities for graph embeddings. And the other is the vector value distance. That is, um, it helps us to compute the distance, but it also carries much more information than just the distance. And it can be used as a tool for graph analysis. And then the implementation that, that we saw on single spaces in particular, these are matrix models of the hyperbolic plane that we saw how they tie or outperform the constant, constant curvature baselines on different tasks. And the cool thing of this approach is that it doesn't require any previous assumption on geometric features of the graph. We, we don't pre-analyze the graph and then choose the space. Um, we just throw the, the graph into the network and the network automatically learns how to place different nodes either in the Euclidean subspaces or in the hyperbolic subspaces. And we also show how the approach offers flexibility and, and enhanced representation capacity that can be exploited for downstream tasks. So that's it for the presentation. And let me know if you have any further questions. Thanks a lot uh, for the presentation, Federico. It's uh, very interesting. And uh, I think it's a very great way like, of taking something as complex as the graph and projecting it into a space that's uh, easier to use. Um, I have a couple of questions, but first I would like to ask the audience if they want to ask their question before I jump in. All right, uh, I will go on, but first um, I will go through the questions in the chat. So one of the questions is, can you use this approach for graph classification instead of uh, node classification? Um, yeah, we haven't tried any graph classification task, but the idea, a priori, I, I could say it's possible. Like um, at least the, what I have seen, like, I mean, the thing that I can compare it the closest in a way is like, it's not the same again, because this is a featureless approach and it's only based on the structure. But uh, if you think of um, graph neural networks, when they do graph classification, at least the simplest approaches, that is like once you get the embeddings for each node, you take some sort of pooling operation for the whole graph, and then you classify based on this final embedding in a way. So in this case, you also get like one embedding for each node. And then uh, by taking some sort of average of that, maybe, or some sort of pooling operation based on that, uh, you could a priori fit this into a final classifier. Uh, but again, we haven't we haven't tried anything in particular, so I I'm not aware at least of any concrete application for graph classification of this. But I think it can be done. It, it, it's a it's a valid question. Like I think it's an interesting question to 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 research. Yeah. And uh, another question I have related to that. Uh, most of the examples that you show are about. Um, uh, working on one large graph, is your method suited also to work on a, a data set of many small graphs instead of like one large graphs? Um, yeah, it's, it's similar to, to the question before that we only try like this type of approaches with one graph and try to do some sort of uh, either graph reconstruction or in particular some sort of node classification or, or some node based approach. Uh, so we haven't tried that, but I think it's feasible or, or possible as much as it is with any other graph embedding approach. And uh, do you think uh, do you think the graph embedding will be consistent between all these graphs? Like if you, tr I guess if you train it on all the graphs at the same time, you can have some uh, a consistent way of measuring distances. Basically, it becomes as if you have one large graph that's yeah, right. disconnected, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, I'm thinking the same. Okay. Yeah, it would be very good to see like this kind of approach uh, used as uh, as I said to give positional and structural encoding for the nodes and the edges, and um, then put it into a 
vanilla GNN and see if it helps improve the performance. Um, there have been many work in that direction, as I mentioned, and I, I think uh, what you have proposed here could really help uh, bring something uh, very different than what is currently done in the literature. And I would be very happy to see that kind of approach there. Yeah, could be. Uh, I hope someone <laughs> takes the effort of doing that. Another question in the chat is if you um, have tried your method on multiplex networks, which is, uh, mm. which I'm not sure exactly. Uh, so, uh, Ili, can you um, can you explain exactly what you mean by that? Yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm not aware of what is a multiplex network. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I was thinking about uh, multiplex networks like multi-relational graphs, like you have two different layers of connections uh, between the same nodes or different types of nodes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it could be could be used. Uh, I mean, like follow-up work. Yeah, but it's not exactly the same. But in a very similar line, basically, what we do is we uh, in a follow-up publication that we had of this work in a way is we apply um, this pretty much the same method on a slightly different manifold but like it's the same idea in a way on uh, multi-relational graphs on uh, knowledge graphs and so in that case you, you need to be aware of which type of edge you are dealing with right uh, it's not just connecting like uh, two nodes but it's like you need to know why these two nodes are connected or, or like have some sort of feature or some sort of information about the, the relation. And it worked pretty well. Uh, th that's another work. It's not this paper, it's a, like a follow-up paper. But uh, but yeah, we, we try basically a very similar approach based on all these tools that we presented here, but for multi-relational graphs and it worked pretty well. And again, the advantage is that in this, um, basically in a multi-relational graph, uh, you have like one node that ha can, I don't know, be like in a hierarchy regarding some relationship but it can be more like in a grid regarding a different type of relationship uh, or you can have, you know, in a cycle in a different type of relationship or whatever. Uh, so by, by using these approaches with these spaces that are very expressive because they have different geometries combined, you get advantages because um, the same node can be in one place that is, can be like interpreted as a hyperbolic plane in one way, but in a Euclidean plane in a different way. So that's in a way pretty, pretty powerful. So I, I don't know if it's exactly your question, but these tools have been applied in that by us again in, in basically the in a very similar setup. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, thanks for your answer. Yeah, and my interest would be like how we could combine these two different embeddings into different like uh, spaces that you are showing from for the same node, and how then you are combining this information to have, let's say, the final node representation for the same node that is having different connections in two different layers. But yeah. Maybe in the future we can follow up your next publication. That would be great to look up. Uh, if I can go on with another quick question, like you are preserving the distance very well between the two different nodes. So do you think that this can help also to have a better accuracy on link prediction? Better compared to, I mean, that the performance can be for node classification or some other downstream tasks? Yeah, uh, just a bit of uh, like a advertisement first, uh, like the, the question regarding the previous um, regarding the previous question. Uh, this is the paper, Vector Value Distance and Geocalculus in the Space of SPD Matrices. This is also a paper from uh, in Europe's uh, now in 2021. And in this paper, we do the, the idea of like using the relationships. Uh, so in case you want to, to check that out. And yeah, coming back to the current question. Um, yes, in this case, basically what we are doing is link prediction. Uh, by mining the distances in the space, what we are trying to do is a link prediction task between users and items. And by, by getting a better representation capacity of the nodes and, um, and the distances between them, um, in this case, we can achieve a better performance in, in, in this task. So, so by, yeah, the idea of like a better representation space, a, a better um, embedding space helps you in the final task. But it's a, still a kind of valid question or, or like something that I also wonder is uh, it really depends on how much the task is associated to the structure of the graph. 
So in, in some cases of uh, what I have seen at least in, in graph neural networks, sometimes um, if you like put a much better space to represent the features or the embeddings that you're getting in each layer, uh, that doesn't really help in the end the prediction task because your prediction task doesn't depend so much on, on representing the graph in a very good way. Maybe we're just representing close neighborhoods, that's enough, and you don't need to represent the whole graph as a whole in, in a very accurate way. But in some other tasks where the whole representation of the graph is very important, uh, then this tool is very useful, right? Because you can uh, achieve like a very good, a very low distortion based on the on on how you represent the nodes. So yeah, I hope that kind of answers the, the idea of like yeah, this should help in some cases for link prediction. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question regarding that. Um, one of the, the work that I do the most is involving molecules and uh, uh, molecules, proteins, and try to predict, for example, their 3D structures. Uh, in the work that you're doing right now, you're preserving uh, the distances in the graph. So you have many metrics of distances, the L1, L2, L infinite, that uh, when you project it into a manifold, you try to um, preserve these distances. But suppose that you have um, done a quantum simulation that gives you the 3D distance, like the real Euclidean distance between the atoms in the 3D structure of the molecule. Can you use uh, your method to kind of learn, um, to, to directly uh, like learn a mapping between a molecular graph into a 3D structure? Um, like directly with the uh, with the low parameter budget, basically. Yeah, I'm not really sure uh, if I fully understand the problem there. Um, I mean, what you could do is like you could embed this molecule once you have some sort of distance, and in the method should or, or this space at least should be able to represent it in a much better way. Um, but then your problem, in fact, is like matching this three D structure to something else. Uh, no, it's like you, you have the graph structure and instead of using only like the distances in the graph, uh, you could use the distances between the atoms in the Euclidean space that are provided by quantum simulation and kind of um, use this for the training of your model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th that way the model that you're developing could be kind of, uh, could learn to generate through this structure in a, a uh, very simple way in some sense. Okay, like the idea could be like, if you if I embed different types of molecules, then I, I can also learn to predict what the next molecule is gonna be like, or or I can even try to generate my own molecules in a way or, or like structures. Yeah, generating the 3D structure from the graph by using the distances in the 3D structure. Doing, for example, what AlphaFold has done uh, by predicting the 3D structure of protein from the sequence. Uh, but here, like, um, and the 3D structure can be encoded as a distance matrix, right? A distance between each pair of nodes. So the question is just like, can this fit into you, your current framework, like uh, using this kind of distance that's outside of, uh, outside of the simple molecular graph? Yeah, I think like, like I mean, basically the input to the, to the model it's just a graph, not even a graph, like a set of nodes uh, with distances, like this matrix that you're talking in a way. Uh, so once you just give me that and I embed it in a way, and I don't care where that comes from. Like we know that that's a graph, but we, but the model in a way doesn't care. Uh, so for each node, you're gonna learn one embedding that is gonna try to, to minimize the distortion or to preserve these distances in a, in a very good way in space. And then, yeah, the, the, the shape you're gonna get in the embedding space, then you can mine it and try to understand how the model is placed in the nodes, right? Uh, so that would be in a way the interesting thing to do, uh, to, to say, okay, why the model chooses the, this part of the structure to go close to the hyperbolic space? W what is the model seeing that maybe we don't know? Uh, and, or we can, you know, use as useful information to, for us to predict something else. So yeah, I think like part of that could be done. I'm not saying that this is the next alpha fall, of course, uh, just saying that part of it could, in a similar way, be done. Okay, great. Um, thanks for your answer. Uh, so one last time, we would like to ask the audience if they have another question regarding um, 
the paper or the presentation. I have a question. I, I was to ask about the expressiveness. Do you have any experiments that it, uh, if it can distinguish between two graphs? But I guess you didn't have graph embedding, so it may not be related, but still, if the parts of the graph are symmetric or something like this, can it distinguish yeah, no, uh, between them? I mean, we haven't done uh, any of those type of experiments, um, but I think, yeah, it's similar to the graph classification task, right? Um, in a way. Um, so yeah, I think like it could be done in that sense, um, but we haven't done it uh, in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you Federico. And uh, I think it was Beatrice also that was here. So thank you a lot for the presentation. And um, like, we really enjoyed the discussion here. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again for the opportunity and, and it was a pleasure to, to be here. So if you have any further question, you can reach me uh, about the paper, the following paper or anything. I'm happy to, to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're very happy to have, to have you here and the presentation will be available on uh, YouTube so, as soon as possible. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much again. Okay. Thanks a lot, Federico. We learned a lot with your paper today about how to embed nodes in a graph such that we preserve the notion of distances and that we can really project a high dimensionality graph into a lower dimensionality manifold. This paper was very interesting and I'm very eager to see the next iteration of the work, how this can be used, for example, to improve graph transformers or to improve other types of graph neural networks by using them as positional and relative position encoding. For the audience, don't forget that the best way to keep updated with graph neural networks is to follow us on Twitter, subscribe on our mailing list, and subscribe to our calendar. You can find all the links in the description. See you next week.